before we jump in, there's two functions that MATLAB has built in that you can execute in the command window to really help you out with functions. First one's going to be help and the function name. For example, if you want to know more about that function, here we see absolute value. It tells you what the inputs are and what the function actually does. Very useful. The second one, see this little f of x here, right by the left of your two, right, we're down here. Tap that little f of x, and then if you search in here, or even if you just click around, you've got the entire array of what MATLAB has for functions. So you can start looking, okay, look, here's trigonometry. You can see all the relevant trig functions. So you can do sine, a sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant. I mean, you've got everything open to you here. Complex numbers, all the relevant stuff. And you can just search up here. You think, I want to do something that um, rounds a value. Just search for round. And anything that comes up here, we see round. This round towards negative infinity, rounds towards positive infinity. You can just search if I want to look for eigenvalues. Here we see everything that relates to eigenvalues. There's a ton. This could give you all the relevant stuff. So those are two things outside of actual, I mean, it's, this is how you find functions and get more help with functions. Now we'll jump into the actual 19 best functions that I've got for you. We're looking at the 19 most powerful MATLAB functions that you can utilize to optimize your code and work faster to start. Let's jump into it. CLC, close all, and clear all. These are three commands you should throw together side by side to just wipe everything clean between running different scripts and different sections. CLC, when run, will clear everything in your command window. Clear all wipes your workspace variables. And close all will just X out of any figures you've got open. And then when you plot something new, it'll come up as a fresh new figure. Clear vars except when you've got a bunch of variables and you need to wipe things out before doing something else. You can do this in one script itself, or you can do this between running different sections. But here you've got clear bars except Y. So Z and X will be wiped out here, and I can continue to use Y later on in that script. As you can see, no X and Z, and just Y remains. Good. With display, this allows you to output text, numerics, basically anything here in MATLAB. Here I've got a, vari a variable called text to show, and then I'm displaying text to show here. And that'll output directly to my command window. Same here, I've got y is 240, and displaying y, those will both come out as such. The fprintf command actually will help in formatting your text a lot better, and you can combine multiple items. You can't do that in display. Display takes one and just spits it out. In this one, though, we can begin to use different character combinations to help us print better and cleaner. It gets a little bit tricky. Remember, you can always go to help f print f or any function, and it'll explain things much better than I will probably. Um, but here, the way we're doing this is we're starting off. Let's just simplify this right now. Anything on the left side is going to get outputted using items from the right side. If I run this, it's just going to tell me the answer is no big deal here because I haven't called percent %d. Percent %d calls the value on the right. Now we see the answer is. 240. However, the command line is still waiting right after this because we haven't skipped a line. I can still do math here if I want and run other stuff, but it's good form. Let's drop a line using backslash n, okay, and now we drop down and the command window jumps to the next line. If you want to get fancier as I had before, we can do the answer is and then put it on the next line, you know, big build up dot dot dot, call percent %d, and then you can add the units, meters and drop another line. So the answer is 240 meters. Different ways to combine it, just a cleaner way to output your variables together in the same line or different lines. E versus EXP, okay. E is 5 times 10 to the, or sorry, not 5, it just means times 10 to the, okay, and then the power. So 5E2 is 5 times 10 to the second, which should be 500. Similar with 5 times 10 to the tenth, it's a much, much larger number. And then, if you want to do, let's just run those just to see that. There, so there we've got 500, which is 5 times 10 to the second. And then here is 5e to the 10th. That's just the notation MATLAB likes to use for scientific notation. And then, when in your next section here, by the way, I'm using Control R to add comments, and that adds comments to every line, which then they don't run. I'm using Control and T 
to take off a percent sign, which then allows me to jump in and out quickly. You can comment out sections quicker and then uncomment sections pretty quick. Just a little pro tip. Anywho, 5x exp with the argument of 2 gives you that. So e is the growth constant, right? So if you just do x1, there's your growth constant, 2.7183. More variables, more sorry, more decimals to come. So this is 5 times e to the second, and that'll output as well. So you're using exponent there. The difference between those two is important. Don't get it mixed up. Square root pi and absolute value, pretty straightforward. Square root just takes the square root of whatever's inside. Pi is just 3.141 and so on. You can just use that as pi. And then square root here, I've got absolute value inside. Absolute value, of course, just takes the absolute value. So I should have 5, 6 point something, and 5 as my outputs. Yep, all good there. Linspace, great way to start off with creating just a span of, of values. You're going from 0 to 10 using 11 values in between here. If we run this, there we are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10, 10, 10. We could do to 100, and we get probably 10, yeah, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. You could just do to 1, and you could do 100 values. If you really want to get specific, you have a bunch of values in between uh, from 0 to 1. Your choices, but it's a great starting matrix maker. I and 0. I will give you, EYE will give you a square dimension matrix based on the input value, and it's going to be an identity matrix. That's why it's I. Then a matrix just has ones going diagonally down from the top left to the bottom right, and then the zeros will give you just a matrix of all zeros. It's another square matrix based off the input here, so this will be a 4x4, four four, and we'll have a 3x3 three three identity matrix. Run this, identity, zeros. Cool. Determinants can be a pain to calculate by hand. MATLAB does it for you. This is a tool. Use it. All right, here's a 3x3 three three matrix called B. Take the determinant of B, 61. Reduce relational on form. This is when you have a system of equations. Here I've got a system set up. Make sure you keep all the same. You have to have variable 1 all together, so your x is in the first row, or sorry, your first column, your y is in your second column, equals, and then the values. Okay, it has to be set up like this. And then you put these into, you put your coefficients into a coefficient matrix with a right separate row for your second equation. And then you can throw these into the reduced row echelon form command. This gives you x equals 4, which we know that to be true from the first equation. And then y is 1, so 2 times 4 is 8, plus 8 times 1 is another 8, so that's 8 plus 8 is 16. Checks out. All right, hold on for plotting. This is the best way to plot two data sets or lines on one figure or graph. Here I'm plotting x and y, and then I'm plotting x and z. I do that. Cool. You can do one long plot command if you want. You could do plot x comma y, x comma z, and that should work. However, if you do it the way with hold on, you've got access to changing a lot of the colors, the marker lines, the figure, you know, all the details about that data set that you want to change. And I go over all those in my plotting video. You can also do help plot in the command window. And it'll give you all the information you're looking for. Boom. Rand. Okay, Rand is a great uh, calculator almost that gives you a random value between 0 and 1 if you call Rand 1. All right. Rand actually will give you a whole vector. Let's get rid of all this stuff. Let's clear out those values. Okay. Rand 1 will just give you a random variable between 0 and 1. It's going to be a decimal. If you call Rand 2, you'll get a 2 by 2 matrix of random values between zeros and 1s. The best use I've found for this is if you want to get a random value between A and B as your limits, you call Rand 1. This just gives you a random value between 0 and 1. And you're going to scale it times B minus A, and you add A. This is basically saying you're scaling this, so this side will give you a, a random value between 0 and 3. 10 minus 7 is 3. And then you're adding 7 to that, so you'll always start at 7, and then you'll add a random value between 0 and 3 to get random values between 7 and 10. Kind of useful. You can run this, and we'll see where your random values, mostly in the 8s here. But there's some 7s. You should have some 9s. Yeah. You'll never get 10, and you'll never get just 7, by the way, by the nature of it. It's not get, the random function doesn't give you zeros or tens, I don't think. Maybe it does. I don't know. Have fun. Max and min. These function the exact same, so I'm just going to demonstrate the max function. Here I've got a value of a bunch of stresses, or it's a matrix here. 
And I'm going to call, if I just call max of stresses, this will just gives me the maximum value in the set. Okay, so it just spits it out for me. There it is, 90, 90, 12. However, sometimes it's useful to know what position that value is in the matrix, in which case you can use these brackets and you want to call some values in here, you can call um, max value, max value, max value, and position, whatever you want to call these variables. And it's going to save the max value to here. You can even call this, you know, stress max, and then your position or your index you're going to get out of it. And that'll save it to variables, so you end up with stress and index. I'll put some right here as well. Cool. Then you can use those later on. Pretty useful. Same thing with minimum. Same exact call. Here, ceiling, floor, and round. These are different ways to round your variables. Round will round to the nearest integer. That's what we're all used to doing. Floor will round the value down to the nearest integer, no matter where it is. So this will go to 7 here. Ceiling of x, so 5.148. Ceiling always rounds it up, so it's the opposite of floor. So this will round from 5.14 to 6. And fix is going to give you the value rounding towards a zero. Okay, so this will give you negative four. Here we see x, yep, yeah, five to up to s rounds up to this rounds. So this is floor here, so this is down to seven. This is ceiling, this is up to six, and this is towards zero, so negative four. Good. Polyfit and polyval. These work hand in hand and are great for finding a polynomial curve based off of data that you give it. So I've got some data here, x and y. It's about approximately an x squared curve. So I'm going to call polyfit and input x and y. Those are, my, those are my data. And then I call the degree of the polynomial I think it'll be. So what order? So it's going to be x squared, then I put a 2. If it's going to be x cubed, I put 3. That gives you out a, which is the coefficient matrix that you'd have. So your equation becomes, you know, it's y equals constant plus coefficient x plus coefficient x squared. A is what those, those coefficients are. So you get a coefficient matrix A. Then you need to multiply A times your values of X. And that's what polyval does for you. And I'm saving that in a Y fit category or variable. Then I'm going to plot those together. So I'm going to plot the raw data X, Y. And I'm going to plot the new fit data X and Y fit on the same graph here. And then you can see the red line is the fit. And the raw data is the X. So it's a pretty good fit. Roots. You want to find the roots of a function. That's where it evaluates to zero, right? The order matters, of course. You need to organize it in terms of the highest power and then decreasing powers from there. So I've got an x squared, 0x, and negative 2 for this example. It's a second order polynomial. And coefficients here, put them in a matrix. I've got 1x squared, I've got 0x's, and I've got negative 2 as my constant. Throw coefficients inside the roots function. It'll give me root 2 and negative root 2 as my two possibilities for my roots. It'll also do imaginary roots, too, if you're curious. A quick way to do inline functions without doing a whole separate file, and you only have one input, is the at x command. Okay, so you define a function. Here, I'm just calculating a cylinder volume. You add at x after the equal sign, a space in between, very important, and then the formula you want with x in that formula. And that's the value later on you're going to plug a value in for. So here... This is pi r squared times height. That's the definition of volume of a cylinder. This will define the quick function, and then I can use the quick function later on, and you're plugging in your argument is becoming your x. So if I plug in 3, that 3 goes here, and I get a, a volume of a cylinder. Radius is 2 defined with height x equals 3. You can run that. You can see you've got this kind of function that pops up in your workspace. as a, as a It's not, of course, your regular variable. It's a different type. Um, but it's helping you out here and it's solving for you and you can use that throughout your code. Table, another useful one here. You can take elements, define them, put them inside the table command separated by commas. I've saved that into table 1 and then you can display table and it'll output in a nicer format than just having these values get automatically sent to the command line. Of course these could be matrices and you could have them holding more values, and you can actually create a nice table of values going down. Input. The very last one here. If you want to garner user input, and then use that input later, you're going to call the input command, okay? In this scenario, I'm tracking how many cracks are in a bridge. So I've got previous cracks of 42, and I want to know how many more cracks happen today. So I'm going to prompt the user. This is all going to be a text prop here. 
you don't put numbers here, you don't put integers, you have to put something as a text, that's what it's going to get sent to the command window. If we run this, see how many cracks in the bridge today. I'm going to say there's about 13 cracks in the bridge today after our, you know, survey. Enter that, and I'm using this later, because I stored that 13 and new cracks. I used new cracks plus previous cracks to get total cracks for the day. And if this plays out here, total cracks is 55, and we got to get cracking. Great. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know if you have any comments or if you have any better functions too that you're thinking of. Hope this was valuable. Take care and keep on coding. See ya.